I'd like to get us started um, following that with our first session um, from Court to City Urban Cultures and Literary Exchange. And I just plan to do the papers in order, uh, assuming that's okay with everybody. Um, I'd first like to start with Charlotte Steinbrugge, uh, who's speaking on the mas Master Bundice of Brabant in the Croxton play of the Sacrament. So thank you very much for inviting me. So the Croxton play of the Sacrament is a play where dangerous outside influence on the one hand and healing on the other hand seem paramount. And Master Brundic of Brabant seems to be the person in which these two different strands converge, or do they? So first to introduce the play. Um, the Croxton play of the Sacrament is from East Anglia and it's probably from the late 15th century. It's an unusual play because it's the only surviving English play on a Eucharistic miracle, uh, the key word here being surviving, I think. It's also the sole English play to be set in near contemporary Europe. And to a large extent, I think that the, the topic of the play can explain for that setting. So continental plays on Eucharistic miracles often deal with reasonably local and recent history. So for instance, in 15th century Brussels, drama was used to commemorate a Eucharistic miracle, which had supposedly happened there in 1370. But again, the Croxton play of the sacrament is slightly unusual in this regard. Yes, it is set in near contemporary history, but it is by no means local history. The supposed miracle happened in 1461 in Iraclea in Aragon. So the actual source of the story isn't known. The play mentions being based on a performance in Rome, which may but need not reference a miracle play that was performed in honor of Eleanor of Aragon in Rome in 1473. But as no play text of that performance survives or a detailed eyewitness account, it's impossible to tell um, the level of influence or even if there was any to begin with. And the oddities of the play do not stop there. Unlike more typical anti-Semitic Eucharistic miracle plays on the continent, the main Jewish protagonist doesn't have a wife and children, but male companions or accomplices. The Jews convert and are baptized at the end of the play, whereas more standardly they are executed. The abuse of the host is perhaps unusually drawn out and no other surviving Eucharistic miracle play features a doctor and his boy. And it is of course a doctor that's gonna be uh, the focus of my analysis. Um, his name is generally agreed to stand for Brandage. Um, the, the very different form of the name on line 609 I've only really noticed as I was preparing this presentation and I've, no one seems to comment on it. And I, if you have any ideas about what it's supposed to stand for or how it refer, represents Brandage, please let me know. Um, so obviously based on the name, the connection between this character and the Low Countries is, is self-evident. However, the connection between this character and the remainder of the play is far from evident. So some scholars have argued that the theme of healing is appropriate in the play. Jonatas, the main Jewish protagonist, has by this point in the play lost his hand and so needs healing. Jonatas and his fellow Jews are also in dire need of spiritual healing, uh, given their lack in faith in transubstantiation and also in the clearly miraculous events that are happening in front of their very eyes. The physical injury is very much the outcome of spiritual disease and arguably no earthly doctor can heal Jonatas. And indeed Jesus will come a little later in the play to heal him. Um, and it's made very clear that the physical injury is due to spiritual disease, that contrition is what allows um, the cure eventually. And then Jonatas puts his hand in the cauldron and it's whole again. So the play would then stage a failed doctor to highlight the importance and superiority of spiritual well being and healing. But for that point to really stand, for the play to really make that point, the doctor should at the very least try to heal Jonatas and fail to do so. But that's not the case. Uh, the doctor and his boy approach the Jew in order to help him, but they're immediately chased away physically, as you can see here, shall the four Jews beat away the leech and his man. Moreover, there are also suggestions in the play that Master Brindich is actually a quack, so he wouldn't have been able to cure anything anyway. As such, the physical versus spiritual dichotomy, um, while still present, is perhaps not as strong an explanation for the inclusion of this scene as some scholars have assumed. Another suggested reason for the episode has been a need for a comic interlude. This is a really difficult one to gauge because so much would depend on how the testing was staged and how it was perceived by the audience. Certainly to modern readers of the play, there's a lot of scope for comic potential and even slapstick humor, which rather undermines this the idea that we need a comic interlude at this point. Moreover, the comedy of the Doctor episode is by no means exploited to the degree that it could have been 
and I would argue would have been if comedy was the main reason for having it. So for instance, the doctor's useless and successful attempts of curing Jonatas could easily have had comic potential, but there are no such attempts. That's not to deny that the, the scene is funny. It is very much so. Colas clear irreverence towards the doctor and his skill is evident throughout the passage. He praises Master Brundage as the most famous physician that ever saw urine. He sees as well as non, at noon as at night and sometimes by candlelight can give judgment the right as he that has no eyes. The doctor's skill is clearly called into question by Kohler, his boy, and his intelligence, I think, is also called into question by his seeming oblivion to Kohler's irreverence and near constant double entendre and sexual innuendo. The doctor himself also says a few things that makes him, us question his competence and character, although it's a bit more ambiguous, perhaps. So he claims to have saved his last patient by giving her a drink made full well with scamoli. And scamoli was certainly used as an aphrodisiac. So that ties in with Collar's claims that his, do his doctor sleeps around with his female patients. A little later on, he's searching for his bag with profitable drink, which may well refer to medical potion, but certainly suggests alcohol in light of Collar's references to his master's frequent visit to the tavern. On the other hand, most of the doctor's lines are perfectly above board, not in the least bit funny, and his approach to Jonathan seems courteous, professional. Again, there doesn't seem to be any comedy there whatsoever. So the comedy of this interlude is mainly verbal, though the doctor and his boy being physically beaten off stage by the Jews might have been quite funny. And it is actually relatively restrained, given all this, plus the fact that it's not entirely clear that we need some kind of comic interlude at this point in the play. It seems that comedy is not the main purpose for this episode. Why then have it? Whether it's original, which I assume traditionally was assumed to be an interpolation, but most people now accept it's original, or even if it is a later edition, why insert it anyway? Now, I believe that the answer can be found in the nationality of the doctor and the local references contained in this episode. So the interlude references the doctor's lodging near Babwell Mill, um, which is near Bury St Edmunds. And this anchors the play, which is supposedly set in Aragon, explicitly in East Anglia. And this allows the focus to settle on an important theme of the play, the danger of outside corrupting influences. The Doctor is not the only character used to make this point. In fact, the danger of the foreigners is particularly made clear in the figure of the Jews, who are not native to Eraclea, but come instead from Surrey, which is Syria, not Surrey in England, and come to Aragon to trade, um, to trade, but also, of course, to purchase a Eucharistic wafer and then test it. The Jews' trading partner is the Christian Aristorius, who is very much represented as a local Aragonese merchant, but he is nonetheless associated with foreign travels. His opening speech contains a long boasting, alliterative and largely alphabetical list of places where he trades from Seba in Yemen to the Faroe Islands. The very form of his speech is suspect, bombastic, boastful alliterative, alliterative lists are the trademark of characters such as Herod and the devil in late medieval England. In Aristorius' speech, I think the place names make this character even more suspect, associating with places like Brabant, Dordrede, Hildre, and Holland in itself corrupts. Now, it's not just low country places, of course, that are listed, but they are quite prominent, I think. So the Jews have come from Syria on their dubious quest and end up perverting further. I think the implication is that Aristorius is already in some way fallen, but end up perverting further a local merchant, leading him, causing him in turn to beguile his priest who in turn fails in his duty to protect his church and his pigs and his Eucharistic wafers. While ultimately the play has a happy ending, the visit of foreigners initially causes a domino effect of ill deeds which require redress. The intrusion of Master Brundage of Brabant can be looked at in the same light. An alcoholic, itinerant quack who will sleep with your wives and daughters and widows and very possibly make you worse rather than cure you even if you weren't ill in the first place, is of course a much more mundane, but I think no, le no less real danger for a contemporary East Anglian audience. Now, East Anglian economy strongly relied on trade with the low countries, uh, and this inevitably resulted in a level of competence and rivalry, competition rather, and rivalry, and the presence of aliens or immigrants from the low countries in England. And this is usually taken as sufficient sort of historical evidence to explain the very presence of, of this Dr. von Babant in the play and the anti Flemish sentiment um, that people read into the play, or, or people think is in the play anyway. But 
I would like to take a little time to look a little bit closer at the presence of immigrants from the Low Countries and particularly from Brabant in East Anglia and to the degree to which these immigrants are or are not associated with medical professions. So playing around with the wonderful England's immigrants 1330-1550 resident aliens in the late Middle Ages database which is freely accessible online gives us a better sense of how typical or not master brindage of Brabant's lodging near Babwell Mills uh, in East Anglia may have been. Now, the records used for this database are very much incomplete, so we can only get a glimpse of the situation on the ground. Unfortunately, given the probable date of our play in the late 15th century, the subsidy records for um, the later 15th century are not particularly fulsome. There's a gap from 1471 to 1483-84 when the last collection uh, was imposed and there's nothing later. So from the later 15th century, there's very little data to work with really. Um, even for years when there was a tax collection, steep fluctuations in numbers year on year uh, suggest that not all assessments were equally thorough. Another issue in the record is the origin of immigrants, which is sometimes but not always listed, but when it is listed, it's not always reliable. For example, a cloth maker named Joost de Mon is labelled as being Italian, despite his name very much suggesting a low country's origin. So as a result, we do have to be quite careful with what we find. Um, nevertheless, the picture flawed and fragmented though it is, emerges. So I have only looked at Norfolk, where Croxton, where the play is supposed to be performed, and Suffolk, where Babwell Priory and Babwell Mills are, which are associated with Bury St Edmunds. So because those are the two counties that seem most relevant. I've looked at 1440, which is the earliest tax um, record, to 1500, which I thought was a good cutoff um, date for the composition of the play. So the majority of immigrants in Suffolk and Norfolk in that time are described as Dutch, which suggests a link to the Low Countries. But how typical might a doctor from Brabant specifically have been? If we search for the keyword Brabant from uh, 1440 to 1500, we get 305 entries. And of course, there may be some duplication because people may have paid a tax in more than one year. And the vast majority of these do seem to be from Brabant, though not all of them are. Some people are then labeled French as well. Um, so we find people from Brabant in Norfolk and Suffolk, as you can see, 13 in Suffolk and 10 in Norfolk, but these counties are not particularly well represented, they're incredibly low in the list. So for instance, London has 40 and Cambridgeshire has 80. Um, we find quite a range of occupations. Uh, we find seven servants, one beer brewer, um, a beer seller who's also a householder, so it seems to be quite a reputable job, and she's actually female, so that's quite interesting, a weaver, and the remainder are people with no uh, specified occupation. Now, most of the people with unspecified occupation are actually householders, which suggests a certain economic and social status. So despite the smaller numbers in Norfolk and Suffolk, we can safely assume that people from Babant were present in a variety of trades and with a wide range of social status. Uh, searching under the keyword medical, same dates, uh, gives 67 entries. And again, of course, there may be some reduplication there. Three of these entries are listed as Dutch and another three as Flemish. None of these are based in East Anglia. Not a single entry in the list has an obvious link to Brabant, although it must be said that quite a lot of them have no known origin, so it's definitely possible that there were some, and they just, it's, we just don't have the data to make, that, uh, to make that clear. Of the seven members of the medical profession, foreign members of the medical profession that are listed for Suffolk, there is no one apparently in Norfolk, um, none of them are from the Low Countries, although one, a uh, certain Derek, who's a beer brewer and a surgeon, um, is without a known place of origin, so he may have been. The status of these men varies quite widely from the two Picard servants of a barber to the Aragonese doctors of medicine. Of course, we must bear in mind the gaps in misinformation in the records um, and certainly itinerant uh, immigrants like Master Brundage seems to have been would have been harder to pin down. But nevertheless, we can't say that a strong picture of low countries medical men working in East Anglia or even England more generally emerges, let alone that there is a link between Brabant and medical men. However, continental medical training was more highly regarded than English medical training at this point in time. So having a doctor from the continent may well have led an extra cachet. Um, the likelihood that our doctor is a quack then renders, I think he supposed continental origins even more ironic. He's been there or he studied there or he is from there, but he's even so he still is a bad doctor. But this actually brings me to my next point. Is he even from Barbant? Only one scholar to my knowledge actually questions his origin. Um, so he's a foreigner or perhaps an Englishman who has something um, to gain by claiming to be from the continent. The idea being that 
being from the continent suggests that you're a better doctor. So it's used as an advertising strategy, which indeed it is. It is used as an advertising strategy by his crier. So the label of Brabant is used twice by Kola, his boy, before the doctor actually appears. And Kola is a very circumspect source of information because he admits to having lied to his audience, i.e. us. Um, there is nothing in the uh, speech of the doctor or uh, in the uh, stage directions to suggest a foreign origin of the doctor. He doesn't speak Dutch, he def doesn't reference his places in the low countries, he doesn't speak with a foreign accent. Now the latter is a, is a tricky one because it's not entirely clear to what extent that would have been reflected in a written version, it's something that could have been added in performance. Famously, the Tiny Second Shepherd's play features a sheep stealing northerner who pretends to be a southerner, and this is reflected in the written text by using uh, southern dialect features. However, the Tiny manuscript is from the mid 16th century, and we don't know the date of the play, so it may be that it's a bit too late to use as sort of comparable evidence for our play. However, as the play text survives, nothing in the text suggests that the doctor sounds or tries to sound foreign. And if indeed he doesn't sound foreign, this perhaps brings to the fore, whether intentionally or not, the fact that Master Brindici is in fact native English, or at least he sounds and looks native English, despite the label of Pabon. And this rather complicates the overall message of the play. The Croxton play of the sacrament is evidently very anxious about dangerous outside influences. The local merchant with international trade links, the foreigners visiting our shores, and the foreign doctor all present dangerous corruption. So is he or is he not foreign? The end of the play tries to circumscribe these dangerous foreign influences. The Jews convert, now baptized, and promptly leave Heraclea. Aristorius, the local yet international merchant, is punished by the bishop at the end of the play and is banned from trading forever. So he becomes, in a way, more localized. But the ending is not as neat as we might think. The itinerant and perhaps foreign doctor is chased away by the Jews earlier on in the play, but he's never redeemed. That's the only character not to sort of be somehow redeemed in the play, and he's never formally expelled either. This danger continues to lurk. Moreover, the ending calls into question the equation between internationalism and corruption. Both the recent converts and the reclaimed Aristorius take a peripatetic and seemingly international lives. Their future travels clearly serve as penance, but also have the purpose of teaching and converting people. This is fascinating for two reasons. Firstly, despite that the fact that these are all now good Christians, it nevertheless does not seem possible to incorporate these reclaimed souls into the Iraqlean setting. Not only do these characters have to leave and travel elsewhere, it seems very likely that the actors actually physically leave the stage at this point as well, as these lines make clear. As a result, the Christian society of Heraclea at the end of the play is incredibly bare, consisting only of the bishop and the priest. Without foreigners and international locals, there's barely any society left. Secondly, the travels of Jonatas, Jason, Jasdon, Malchus, and Malchus, and Aristorius are clearly positive, having a penitential and even missionary intent. Nevertheless, even if they were to um, only travel back home, and that's not by any means clear that that is what they're doing, these men represent foreign influences, which will try to change and have some kind of impact on their destinations. While this impact would presumably have been deemed good by a Christian East Anglian audience, it still indicates that rejecting and dismissing foreigners and foreign influences is rather too simplistic. In fact, the very Croxton play is explicitly said to be foreign, being supposedly based on events which happened in Aragon, as well as a performance in Rome. And it is certainly intended to influence its East Anglian audience into confirming or encouraging their faith in transubstantiation. The end of the play also certainly casts some doubt on the ease with which we can distinguish between local and foreign, which we have encountered to an extent also in relation to the doctor, who may well be an Englishman pretending to be foreign, or whose crier may pretend he is foreign as a kind of advertising strategy. Our historian's claims, into my country now will I travel or fare, when he's about to leave the stage for the last time. Now, at the beginning of the play, as we have seen, he's explicitly linked with Heraclea, where all the events have happened, so where we are still situated. But now, suddenly, his country seems to be elsewhere. Again, the boundary between local and foreign is malleable, and the ease with which people may seem foreign or local despite not being so is disconcerting. All of this also applies to the play itself, which is clearly an English composition, despite its claim to the contrary, and which is expressly set in local East Anglia, despite depicting a Spanish miracle. 
These various complications seem appropriate for a play that is full of contradictions, despite its, at first glance, heavy-handed nature. The inclusion of a doctor from Babant at first sight fits the play's ostensible purpose of highlighting the dangerous nature of foreign influences. And in the context of East Anglia, where there was no immigration from the Low Countries, he seems like an obvious choice. But on closer inspection, it's not clear that a doctor, rather than say a merchant or a tradesman, um, and someone from Babant, rather than someone from the Low Countries more generally, was the most obvious or logical choice for expressing and presumably encouraging anti-Flemish feeling. In fact, it's not even entirely clear that the doctor is from Babant or claims to be himself, He's, his advertiser does, but he never does. Instead, the figure of Master Brundich of Brabant helps to further muddle the initially clear image of dangerous outside influences that can be successfully averted by good Christian faith. On close reading, the play shows that dangerous influences can be internal as well as external in origin, that foreign and local cannot always be accurately distinguished, that not all foreign influences or external influences are corrupting and evil, and that not all corrupting presences and, and influences can be successfully expelled. While at first sight, Master Brundich of Brabant may seem straightforwardly to indicate a marked prejudice against people from the Low Countries, it is certainly also possible to see this character very differently as enabling a resistant reading of the play that would suggest a more welcoming and nuanced appreciation of international trade links and immigration. Thank you.